I really believe that uh, Pastor Kilpatrick in, uh, is now in the Mobile area, was, of course, the pastor at uh, Brownsville Assembly in uh, Pensacola, Florida for years at the uh, uh, Brownsville Assembly that had that long-standing revival for years, and now he pastors a church outside of Mobile called the Church of His Presence. And, and I really believe that uh, Pastor Kilpatrick has a prophetic voice uh, for America. There's been times past that he has said uh, great words that have just resonated in the body of Christ. And I love the way he says that. It, I mean, I don't love it in a way that I'm be proudful or being, uh, you know, arrogant, but uh, it's such a strong word that he says, every eye is going to see him, and you better make sure you're on the right side when you see him. How many believe we are living in the last days? H how many of you have heard pastors preach about the last days all your life? H how many of you have been saved for over 10 years? How many have been saved for over 20 years? How many have been saved for over 30 years? I got my hand up, and you're probably thinking, how could he be saved over 40 years? He's only 29 years old. How, how many have been saved for a long, long time? How many have been saved just about as long as you can remember? Okay, now, how many remember the message of the soon coming of Jesus? One of the first messages in the body of Christ, Jesus is coming back soon. You know, we used to preach four messages, it seemed like every Sunday and every Wednesday. We would preach on salvation, we would preach on divine healing, we would preach on the second coming of Jesus Christ, and we would preach on the baptism in the Holy Spirit. How many think we need to get back to some basics? And one of the messages, I've, I gave us a series on this some weeks back, months back, and some of you remember this, but there's a lot of people that are new. Uh, it defies my imagination it really does that in this day and hour we're seeing prophecy fulfilled in warp speed I mean there is more happening in the news every day that is fulfilling Bible prophecy and yet at least it seems to me like nobody is talking about it nobody is preaching about it pastors are just settled into their little routines of sharing their little messages and teaching their little programs but man I tell you what God needs to get our attention and I I'm not panicking. I'm not saying that, you know, we need to be uh, overly fearful, but we do need to work while it is yet day, for the night is going to come when no man can work. And some of you have probably been noticing in the media, social media, and different things that a lot of people have been saying some things about the month of September. And, of course, this video, he, he produced this a, a week or so ago, right about the first of the month of September. And uh, there are a lot of things that some prophetic teachers, now I appreciate what he said. He wasn't saying he's making a whole, uh, a, a hard and fast prophecy. He didn't say this is exactly, he said it might be. And, and it might be that we would take note of some things, of some warnings in the scripture. How many have heard of this uh, teaching this year in 2015 of the blood moons? Does anybody know what that's all about? I'm not an expert on it, but I've invited someone. <laughs> he may not call himself an expert, but Brother Gary Malloy, that's a member of our church. He's been away for the summer. Uh, he's going to be back in a couple of weeks. I've asked him on a Wednesday night. I think it's the 23rd of September. He's going to be studying, and he's going to be prepared. He's going to do a teaching that night, the 23rd of September, on the blood moons. And uh, he, he's been reading. There's a book that uh, John Hagee has written, and a lot of other people have been talking about it. But just get to give you an overview, because it fits into this video with the month of September. This year, there are four blood moons that occur on the Jewish feast days. And uh, this is uh, the, the only the fourth time that this has happened in some 500 years. So this is a very unique occurrence. And in this year, 2014 and 2015, it has happened four times. Now, three of these have already happened, and the final one is coming up at the end of this month on September the 28th. On April the 15th, 2014, there was a blood moon, and that was at the Jewish Feast of Passover. On October the 8th, 2014, there was a blood moon, and that was during the Feast of Tabernacles. In April the 4th of this year, there was another blood moon, and that was on Passover. And then the one that is yet to come, the fourth one of these four in these last two years, is on September the 28th. I think that's a Sunday, actually, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, that's during the Jewish Feast of Tabernacles. And a lot of prophecy teachers are declaring boldly that this 
four old blood moons that just ahead is, is signal, signaling something is getting ready to happen. Very significant. Uh, let me just read something here real quick. A blood moon is a lunar eclipse that occurs when the earth passes between the sun and the moon. This blocks the sun's rays from reflecting off the moon as normal. However, some of the sun's rays curve around the earth, causing the moon to appear red during a total eclipse. Because of its vivid color, a total lunar eclipse is often referred to by NASA as a blood red moon. The occurrence of blood moons is quite common, normally happening at least twice per year. Most of us have seen the moon when it's in that appearance and it has changed to red. But when four blood moons happen in close succession, NASA refers to this as a tetrad. Tetrads are rather rare, and they've only taken place 55 times since the year 1 AD. And prophecy teachers are telling us that this is a very significant time because when these tetrads, when these four series of blood moons all happen within a period of, of 24 months or so, some major events have happened, particularly in reference to the Jewish people. The Spanish Inquisition took place in 1492, just after the four blood moons of that era, 1493 and 1494. The nation of Israel was born, of course, in 1948, just after or just before the Tetrad of 1949, 1950. The city of Jerusalem was reunited during the Tetrad of 1967, 1968. So should we pay attention to these kinds of things? Absolutely. How many know no one knows the day nor the hour that the Son of Man comes? How many know we also should know the signs of the times? Jesus said we should not be in darkness that the day should overtake us, but we should understand and be discerning. Like in the Old Testament, the Bible says that the sons of Issachar were people that knew the signs of the seasons of the times in which they were living in, and they were able to be wise because they knew the times in which they were living. We need to be wise, and uh, we need to be observant of these things. Let me say this really quickly, and then we'll get to the book of Revelation. Uh, studying the stars, the moon, and that sort of thing can be taken two ways. There is something that's called astrology. How many know we're not into that? Come on, somebody. <laughs> that is a superstition. It is demonic. It is evil. It is satanic. I don't need to get up in the morning and read my horoscope to know whether or not I'm going to have a good day. My Bible says this is the day the Lord hath made. We'll rejoice and be glad in it for the mercies of the Lord are new every morning. I don't, I don't have to look at two things in the newspaper when I get up. I don't have to check the obituary to see if my name is in there. And I don't have to check my horoscope to see whether I'm going to have a good day or not. As long as I've got breath in my lungs and as long as Jesus Christ is Lord of my life, it's going to be a good day, and my intention is to be Satan's worst nightmare every day of the week. But superstitions like astrology, we're not interested in, but there is a science, and God is not anti-science. In fact, the more you know about God, you'll find he's a pretty smart guy. He, he's pretty scientific, in fact. He, he kind of had a way of creating that, by the way. And so there is a science of astronomy that's not a superstition like astrology. And in the Bible, there are several things that we're told to pay attention to. I'll just hurry this. Genesis 1.14. Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. Let there be signs and for seasons and for days and years. And God specifically said, let them be for signs. Then a couple of scriptures concerning these blood red moons. Joel 2. I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth. Blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and the terrible day of the Lord comes. Revelation 6, 12. And I beheld when he opened the sixth seal. And lo, there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair and the moon became as blood. So we're not dogmatic. I'm not like Pastor Kilpatrick said. We're not saying that this is you know, going to be the end of the world, but we're saying we do need to be aware of these signs because God is trying to get our attention. Everybody still here tonight? Say amen. So take your Bible and let's go to Revelation 
Tonight we're in chapter 14. Now, I know it was two weeks ago since we were in the book of Revelation. Last Wednesday night, we had the promotion for our boys and girls, the impacts and the Royal Rangers and so on. And uh, if you remember, two weeks ago tonight, we were going to get through chapter 14, and we didn't quite make it. In fact, we didn't even get halfway. There are seven scenes, seven visions that are in chapter 14. 14, a series of seven separate visions. Each vision is like a message in itself. And I intended last two weeks ago, Wednesday night, to get all the way through the seven visions. And we just got through two of them. And we started to talk about the third one. And our time was gone. I, I don't know where it went, but it just was gone in, in a heartbeat. So let me remind you, as you look at chapter 14, the first vision of this chapter is in verses 1 through 5. I'm not going to read it, but just glance at it. The first vision of chapter 14 is the vision of the 144,000. Now, when the obvious sense makes the best sense, any other sense is nonsense. And uh, what does the Bible clearly tell us in other places, other chapters earlier in the book that the 144,000 represent? They represent the Jehovah Witnesses. No, wrong. <laughs> they represent the Mormons. No, that's not right either. They represent the nation of Israel. 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel that will be sealed, that will be protected and preserved by God's grace and mercy during the great tribulation period. So the first vision is of the 144,000. The second vision is in verse number 6. And the second vision in verses number 6 and 7 is the vision of a messenger of salvation. Let me just read this. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, here was his message, three-point sermon. Because he went to the same Bible college that I did. We probably preach three-point sermons. Stand up, speak up, and shut up. That's a three-point sermon. No, here's his three points. He said, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth and the sea and the springs of water. So the second vision was of this angel, this messenger of salvation. So here's the third vision. Verse number 8, and uh, hopefully we can get through vision 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7 in the next uh, little while. Verse number 8, look at it. This is the third vision of the chapter. Another angel, a second angel, followed saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She who made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. Now, here we have a sequence. One messenger, one angel follows after the other. And this third vision, the second angel, comes to make a declaration. He comes to declare that fallen, fallen, and like when it's repeated like that, that's for emphasis. Just like Jesus said, verily, verily, I say unto you. That's like, uh, you know, pastors usually always have some little catchy phrase. I was under the uh, teaching of a pastor one time, and when he got really serious, he'd go, listen, listen. That was always his way of, of getting your attention, you know. Get this, get this. I listen to myself sometimes just to make sure I don't get caught in any ruts, and I find myself often saying, get a hold of this, get a hold of this. So, you know, Jesus is saying, verily, verily, I say unto you, or fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She who made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. Now, we know that in the Old Testament, Babylon was a city. In fact, Babylon was the place where they tried to build, originally, the Tower of Babel. Now, what was that intention? That intention was to rebel against God. God said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and, and subdue it. But under the rebellion of that guy, you remember his name there in the book of Genesis? His name was Nimrod. Somebody said it's Nimrod the Nimwad. But anyway, he said, we're going to rebel against God. Remember he said, we're going to build a tower up to the sky? And I don't really think they intended that they could reach the heaven, do you? Do you think he was really that stupid? I don't think so. But how many know Satan will get people to do anything if they don't listen to the voice of the Lord? So he, in rebellion, created this rebellion against God. Now, 
later on, Babylon became a city, and it was in the area where present-day Baghdad stands. But the Bible says in the Old Testament that the city of Babylon was destroyed, and prophecy is very clear. It says it will never be rebuilt again. So if we're in the book of Revelation, and this is talking about fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, then how are we to take that? Well, Babylon the city is destroyed, never to be rebuilt again, but the system called Babylon is alive and well. And let me give you a definition. I learned this from Pastor George Westlake. I talk about him often in when I was a young man in Kansas City. He says that Babylon represents, and get this, <laughs> now get a hold of this, man's organized rebellion against God under Satan. That's the system of Babylon. How many realize it's alive and well today in the United States of America? Man's organized rebellion against God under the leadership of Satan. Now, this messenger comes out and he makes the declaration here, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. And what this is just a pronouncement. We won't really see this in its entirety till the announcement comes in chapter 16, then in chapter 17 and chapters 18, it'll all fit together and we'll discover that Babylon, not the city, the city was destroyed, never to be rebuilt again, but the system of Babylon in the end times, in the great tribulation is going to be threefold. There's going to be religious Babylon, that's the apostate church, that's all of the world religions, the antichrist, the anti-Jesus, all of the nominal religious philosophies of the world, man's organized, re how many know Satan loves religion? I mean, he thrives on religion, and the antichrist is going to be very religious, and, and everybody will think, isn't this wonderful, but it's not true religion, it's, it's false religion, it's the kingdom of Babylon. Babylon, religious Babylon, but Babylon will also have a commercial arm that has to do with money, that has to do with uh, merchandise and, and marketing and commerce, and that will be how that Antichrist controls the economy of the world, but it will also have a political fold. So Babylon is threefold. It's religious Babylon, it's commercial Babylon, it's political Babylon. And in the end times here, when we'll see this in a couple more chapters, chapter 16, 17, and 18, this Babylon system is going to fall. We're going to see religious Babylon crumble. We're going to see commercial Babylon crumble. And we'll see political Babylon crumble. So here in chapter 14, this is just merely a preparation, an announcement that it's coming. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She who made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her, spirit, of her sexual immorality. And of course, that's a word picture. Because often in the Bible, idolatry and immorality fit together. And God looks at idolatry as spiritual immorality. Because God had married himself, remember, in the Old Testament to the nation of Israel. But the nation of Israel often would turn away from God. And that's why God would send prophets like Hosea and other prophets to tell them that they are like spiritual adulterers. Because God had married himself to the nation of Israel. But they don't get offended by this. But they had went whoring after other gods. They had went following after other idols. And it was a smoke in the nose of God. And here he says that Babylon, man's organized rebellion, will finally come to destruction. She who made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality or spiritual idolatry. Okay, let's go to the next one. This is the fourth vision of this chapter. This is verses 9, 10, and 11. I'll read these three verses. Another angel... A third, third angel but fourth vision, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he will also drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest, day or night, these worshipers of the beast and its image, and whoever receives the mark 
of its name. So this third angel adds to not only the pronouncement that Babylon is fallen, but now is the declaration that those that have drank the spiritual uh, wine of the adultery, the idolatry of God, will also drink the cup of God's wrath. Now, how many know that we serve a God today of mercy and grace and love? How many know that God loves everybody? But how many also know that God is a God of wrath and vengeance and judgment? I think sometimes we need to realize that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Some people read in the Old Testament that God is, you know, a God of wrath and of judgment. And then they read in the New Testament about the love and the mercy. And, and they think, oh, aren't we so glad that, you know, that mean God of the Old Testament, he, he's no longer around. And now we have the nice little kind, gentle Jesus how many know that when we read a few weeks ago, we find out that one of the things that mankind is going to fear is the wrath of the Lamb? Now, that's kind of an interesting phrase, the wrath of the Lamb. But remember when the heavens depart like a scroll and when there's no clouds, when there's no atmosphere, when there's no stratosphere, when, when everything departs and you can just look right up. And remember what they said? They could see up into the heavens and what they, could they see? They could see directly into the throne of God and they saw the wrath of the Lamb. I got you good news for you. God is a God of mercy and grace and love, but he is also a God of justice and he is a God of strength and of judgment. And uh, we had better not think that God's wrath is something that is not going to happen because God promises it and it will come on the earth during this time. And here is this vision that he gives um, of what this is going to be like. Anyone that worships the beast and its image. Was it a chapter or two ago that we first read about the mark of the beast? The beast and his number and his name of 666. And you remember what I told you that night? You know, if, if you have telephone number, exchange 666. Uh, I'll still call you. That's not a big deal. If you get a check in the mail and it's check number 666 and you're afraid to cash it, just sign the back of it and bring it to me. I'll, I'll take care of it for you. We don't need to be superstitious about these things. And here's what this chapter is going to help us understand, that this mark of the beast, this mark on the forehead or on the hand, will not be something that someone can uh, do unintentionally. This is not something that people need to be afraid of. Oh, accidentally, it's, it's going to be, it's going to sneak up on me. No, the people in this time that received the mark of this beast and the image uh, on their forehead or on their hand will have to totally renounce any allegiance to any God, to any religion, to any source of help in their life other than Antichrist. And they won't do that accidentally. They will do that intentionally. And the reason is there will be, as we'll read in a couple chapters, there will be no way to buy and sell. There'll be no way to survive. There'll be no way to stay alive on planet Earth. So you'll only have one of two choices. You'll either take the mark or you'll die. You'll be martyred. And uh, those that take the mark will not be doing it accidentally or, or mistakenly. They will be doing it very intentionally. And uh, let me, this is a little bit out of uh, schedule. I was going to say this a little bit later. But let me tell you what. If you've ever heard of someone make this kind of a statement, and uh, I'm trying to be really polite here tonight. We've got some new people, and I don't want them to think that I'm really a harsh guy. But I guess I just need to let it out. If you ever heard people say stupid things, how many have ever heard people say stupid things? Stupid things like this. Well, you know, if I don't make it in the rapture, if I miss the rapture, then I'll just allow my head to be chopped off. I'll just not renounce God. I'll become a martyr, and I'll get to heaven because I'll refuse to take the mark of the beast. You ever heard people say stupid stuff like that? I mean, stupid stuff. Here's my first reaction to that. If they can't serve God today, we've got the church on every corner. 
We've got pastors on every channel. <laughs> I wouldn't listen to all of them all the time. You'd get confused as a termite in a yo-yo, but there's a lot of them out there. But we've got churches. We've got pastors. We've got Bibles. You can have your own version. You can have a different version of the Bible for every day of the week. You know, we got, and I'm not making fun of these things, but we've got every good thing that God has given us to the church today. And in this time, that's all going to be gone. And if a person can't follow God and serve Jesus today, what in the world in their right mind, how in the round world <laughs> do they think they're going to serve God at that time? Now, let me just pray so you don't under misunderstand. Some people say the Holy Spirit won't be here. Well, that's a wrong mistaken notion. The Holy Spirit is omnipresent. What's that mean? Everywhere present all the time. He'll be here. He could not ever not be here. That doesn't make really good grammar, but it makes really good theology. God could never, ever not be everywhere. I'm preaching pretty good. Are you getting a hold of this? Get a hold of this. Listen. What the difference is, is that there will not be a church for him to work through. In 2 Thessalonians, it talks about there's a restraining force that's holding back the work of wickedness. And we say, well, what is the restraining force? Is it the Holy Spirit? Is it the church? Is it this or is it that? And I, I'm into this now, so I guess I'd better complete my thought. In that chapter, Paul uses both a masculine pronoun and a feminine pronoun. So he actually a neuter pronoun, I guess, which means that the restraining force is both a what and a him. And if you understand that, it is the Holy Spirit, but it's when he's working through his church. The Holy Spirit will still be here, but he will not have a church to work through. That's why it will be so difficult for someone to not take the mark of the beast. Even though the Holy Spirit will be here, the church will not be the agency of God's work on the earth. And uh, I'll just mention this phrase. I heard this some time back, and I've gotten a hold of this. I, I really like it. I don't know what the percentage is, but nearly Everything I hear from the Holy Spirit comes through a human voice. Almost everything I hear the Holy Spirit say to me comes through the human voice. It comes through some person. It comes through a pastor. It comes through a mentor. It comes through my wife. <laughs> it, it comes through a human voice. And when the human voice of the church is no longer on the earth, even though the Holy Spirit is there, he will not have a church to work through. So it will be very, very difficult. And the only way to survive will be to uh, be martyred, to take that mark of the beast or to refuse and, and literally give your life. So that's, that's that fourth vision there of what's coming. Now you see this, this chapter is just kind of setting us up for what's going to come in the end of the book here in the next uh, few weeks. So let's go on. Verses um, 14, 15, and 16 give us the fifth vision. The fifth vision is different. Let me just read it, and then we'll explain it. Verses 14, 15, 16. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and seated on the cloud, one like a son of man, with a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand, and another angel came out of the temple, calling out in a uh, I lost my thing. calling out to him who sat on the cloud, "Put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is fully ripe." So he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle across the earth, and the earth was reaped. So this fifth vision, this vision of the one like a son of man, would happen, obviously. To be Jesus. That's his favorite name for himself. The son of man. In fact the first place we find him called the son of man. Is in Matthew chapter 8 verse 20. And there it says the son of man hath no place to lay his head. And here in chapter 14 verse uh, 14. It says the son of man is sitting on a cloud. With power and with great glory. How many know he's advanced pretty good? <laughs> he's come from nowhere to lay his head. That he's sitting on the clouds. With power and with great glory. And this is now. 
this picture that we're starting to see in verses 14, 15, and 16 is the beginning of the um, battle of Armageddon. And Armageddon, let me just say this quickly, and Armageddon, we'll see it later on in the, cha- in the book again. Actually, it'll come to fulfillment around chapter 19 or so. Armageddon is not the same thing as the final world war. Uh, world War III, if you want to call it that, that's not Armageddon. That's not the same thing. I preached some weeks ago, maybe it's a couple of years ago now, from Ezekiel on um, the name of the game is oil. We talked about the great northern bear coming down out of Russia to avoid the spoils of the Middle East. And Ezekiel tells us what nations will support Israel when the uh, invaders come to get the spoils that's down underneath the sand. And uh, that, that would be a, a World War III. But Armageddon is not the armies of the world against each other. What Armageddon is, is the armies of the world against the Lord and his Christ. It's not a uh, worldly battle like World War III, and that's the one thing we're not real sure where World War III, this invasion into uh, Israel that's going to release worldwide war, we're not sure where that fits in in the timeline of Bible prophecy, but (laughs) I'm starting to realize it could happen very, very soon. How many know that's the truth? But that's not the same as Armageddon. Armageddon is a spiritual battle where the armies of the world gather to make war against the Lord and his Christ. And I've got to close here in a minute because I want to get through the end of the chapter. But on that occasion, it says that Jesus will speak the word. The battle of Armageddon will not be won through a nuclear warhead. It will not be won through arms and through tanks and Uh, weapons and missiles, it will be won by the sword of the Spirit (laughs) that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lamb, which he will strike down the nations. And Jesus will come riding on the clouds on that white horse and has his new name written on him that no one knows but him himself. And his name is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And uh, I hope you don't get tired of this. It blesses me, so maybe it'll bless you. If I was a betting man, I'd put every dollar I had on the white horse in the last race. (laughs) Because he's a winner. (laughs) He's the one that is going to win. And uh, his name is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So then the sixth vision and the seventh vision kind of flow together. Here at the end of the chapter, verses 17 through 20. And I won't have time to develop this too much, but we want to stay on schedule because I really don't want to be in the book of Revelation after the rapture. (laughs) I want to get it done here in the next few weeks. That was a joke. I won't be here. You No, you won't be here. Verse 17. Then another angel came out of the temple. We'll let the Antichrist, he can pay the mortgage after we're gone. Praise the Lord. Then the, another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, the angel who has authority over the fire. And he called with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle, put in your sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, for its grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle across the earth and gathered the grape harvest of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God Almighty. And the winepress was trodden outside the city and blood flowed from the winepress as high as the horse's bridle for 1,600 stadia. Now, I'm sure that you're aware this is the pictorial uh, illustration here of the battle of Armageddon. That's going to come. The Bible says they will gather together in that valley of Megiddo, which is in the Hebrew tongue called Armageddon. And again, it will be the armies of the world that gather together to make war against the Christ. How many know Satan has wanted to make war against Jesus even before time began? 
You know, everything you read in the Bible is Satan trying to snuff out Jesus. They, they tried in the Old Testament to take out uh, Moses because he was going to be the leader of the people of Israel. And God protected him in the bulrushes. When Jesus was born, Herod tried to take him out. In Nazareth, when he was his hometown, they tried to throw him over a hill and take his life. Satan tries again and again and again. And this final battle, this final battle of Armageddon is going to be Satan. Satan's last attempt, the armies of the world that will gather together to make war against the Christ. And I won't turn to Revelation chapter 19, but there's the, there's the story where it says that he proceeds with the sharp sword that proceeds out of the mouth of the lamb. He strikes down the nations and he will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. And on his side is his name that is written that no one knows but he himself, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So we'll see all of that unfold in the days that are ahead. But these seven visions, and I'm amazed myself. I got all the way through it. I, 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 I'm just amazed. <laughs> I, I knew we could would do this if we disciplined ourselves real closely. We only got through two and a half last week, uh, last time. But we all got all the way through number seven. And uh, as I said in the beginning tonight, if ever the message of the nearness of the coming of the Lord needs to be preached. It's now. It really is. I can remember when I was a kid, and I know a lot of you can, I would be in gospel preaching, and you would just know that Jesus was going to come that night. And uh, you were just scared and spitless that he was going to come that night. Did I ever tell you the story about my friend? I was in high school or so, and uh, my friend came home from school one day, and uh, his parents weren't home. Uh, you know, it's kind of like that story. While I was away at college, my parents moved, but I found them. You know, but no, that's not really what happened. But he came home from school one day, and his, his parents weren't home. They were always there. They always greeted him, and he didn't, he, no one was there. He, he began to look all around. There was no sign of his parents. He began to look out, and he looked up and down his street, and things were just strangely quiet on his street. There weren't any cars moving, there were, and he had decided he must have missed the rapture. He, he, he was, I mean, he was in tears. He was just overwhelmed with grief, and so he called his Sunday school teacher, which happened to be my mom, and he dials the number, and my mom answers the phone, hello? And Jay on the other end says, oh, Sister Coates, oh, I'm just so glad it's you. Because he thought, sure, if she answered the phone, he must not have missed the rapture. But that's the way, that's the way we thought. We need to get some of that thinking back. Because in an hour that you think not, the Son of Man is going to come. And this message is uh, just passe. It's, it's old hat. It's, it's not popular in a lot of Christian circles anymore, but it's still true. And uh, a lot of people would say this, and I've got to close, but a lot of people say, oh, I've heard that all my life. I've heard that stuff, and it, it, if it surely hasn't happened by now, it probably is never going to happen. Well, there's a better way to look at that. If you've been hearing about it for 50 years, then that means you're 50 years closer to the reality of it happening than what you used to be. So he is going to come, and I like Pastor Capastri's statement, when you see him, you better be sure you're on the right side when he comes. So let's stand together tonight. Father, I just thank you again tonight for your promises, for your faithfulness. Lord, thank you so much for this uh, night to come together and sing as a family with the the youth and the young adults and the, the team and the, to just feel the presence of the Holy Spirit in this room and lift us up and get that word from Jeremiah, call unto me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things. And we're reminded tonight, Lord, that this, this month of September could be, could be very, very significant prophetically in the end times. Help us to keep our eyes on Jesus. Help us to be rapture ready. And that means that we're walking right, we're living in righteousness, we're keeping our eyes on the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So bless our families as they go home tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you.